For centuries, Africa has been plundered by foreign powers who seized territory and reaped the benefits of profitable trade routes. In spite of Africa's abundant natural resources, it remains the poorest continent. The International Monetary Fund was formed in 1945 in the aftermath of the Great Depression and the Second World War as part of a new global financial order that was meant to promote sustainable economic growth and reduce poverty. It reports on its members' economic health and acts as a lender of last resort for countries facing financial crises. But according to the United Nations, more than half of the world's poor, 54.8% last year, live in African countries. So are global financial systems failing the continent? A new report by the IMF supports an African Union initiative to remove trade barriers to increase the flow of goods between African nations. It says the African continental free trade area could reduce extreme poverty. We caught up with the IMF's managing director while she was in Nairobi to endorse the AU initiative. Kristalina Georgieva talks to Al Jazeera. The Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you for having me. So you're here visiting Kenya's capital, Nairobi, to launch a paper about trade between African countries, uh, which says that if intra-African trade can be boosted, then up to 50 million people in this continent could be lifted out of poverty. But this comes at a time when the world is uh, suffering from economic shocks, COVID-19, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, and those who are hit hardest are, are here in Africa, economies and people. What is it that you're going to be saying to policymakers and others on this trip to try and make those gains from trade become a, a realistic uh, outcome? Exactly because the uh, global economic environment is challenging and that affects Africa significantly, policymakers need to unleash the potential of trade. We know that global growth is slowing down. African growth is slowing down. It was 4.8% in 21, went down to 3.9. This year it would be 3.6%. And Africa needs to grow twice as fast to meet the aspiration of its people. Trade has proven to be a great instrument to create jobs, opportunities, and increase incomes. And Africa has a long way to go to fully benefit from the potential of trade. If tariffs, tariff and non-tariff uh, barriers are removed, if logistics and transportation are eased, the intracontinental trade can increase by 53%. Trade with the rest of the world can increase by 15%. Just imagine how many new jobs would be there as a result. Real per capita income can go up by 10%. It would be amazing to bring to force the full potential of the African continental free trade, free trade area. And now, exactly because growth is anemic, now is the time to do it. It seems there are some big ifs in, uh, in your answer and in the report. The reality at, you know, at many of these borders, uh, which we travel to often for our work, is, is of course informal trade eclipses. Mm -hmm. The formal sector is very normal for people who want to take goods across borders or through airports or through seaports to pay bribes. Uh, yep. This is you know, not going to governments. That's something that's recognized in the report. And then governments who, of course, depending on income and revenue from, uh, from tariffs, uh, and then also depending for political power on, on pyramids of, of patronage, uh, you know, within which lie the officials who are, who are collecting uh, this money. And uh, what's been signed at the African Union in Addis Ababa and the intentions expressed 
to remove these tariff and non-tariff barriers seem a far cry from the, the reality on the ground and the, the political realities of many of these governments. I mean, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to, to achieve some of these things. I mean, is it realistic? Uh, I agree with you. It is very difficult. Where we are today, there are so many obstacles and so much of the dynamism in trade happens informally. We can't even measure exactly how much is being traded across borders informally. Uh, but I believe very strongly that the crisis is an opportunity and that if you are to be determined to do well for your people, you have to pursue their dream. Their dream is for good jobs, good opportunities. Uh, two points uh, we are communicating uh, in this paper and more broadly. The first one is that um, uh, Africa can take an ex the lessons of others, especially ASEAN. Very dynamic, outperforming during this crisis uh, the rest of the world. They brought tariffs down to 1% among, among themselves. Here, 6%. So there is 5% to shrink to create a better incentive uh, for trade. Two, yes, governments rely on, on these tariffs for revenues, but they have ample space to increase taxation and improve collection of taxes. Uh, even here in Kenya, the uh, revenues are uh, se around 70%, slightly over 70% of uh, GDP. They can go up, up, and on that basis, you can then trim down uh, the revenues you, you collect from, from trade. It doesn't have to be that your revenues shrink. The main message I have uh, in our institution has to Africa is you learned from COVID an important lesson that countries with strong fundamentals, like people with strong immune systems, withstand the shock of COVID much better. Build those fundamentals. And part of this building is the foundation for trade to be a stronger driver for growth. It seems there are a significant number of countries low-income countries in the world, including here in Africa, that, that didn't withstand the shock of COVID or, or the subsequent shock of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which of course has made money borrowed during COVID, has, has become very expensive, the debts have become very expensive. And I think mm -hmm. the IMF has uh, helped out what more than 20 countries in Africa mm -hmm. in, the, in the last couple of years. And one of the things you've spoken about recently is the possibility of uh, if multiple low-income countries default, uh, that this could cause a, a global uh, debt crisis. Uh, what's the risk of that now? Let me first uh, express my uh, very strong empathy for Africa, as well as for other parts of the world that are innocent bystanders. Uh, they are hit by COVID more severely because their capacity to respond, their fiscal space to respond is narrower. They are hit by uh, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine through high prices, inflation, and they're hit by high interest rates and strong dollar that translates into higher debt uh, service. Exactly for this reason, because they, many of them have put their house in order and yet they're being hit. Uh, the fund has very substantially increased engagement with Africa. Over the last uh, year since COVID, we have provided $50 billion through special drawing rights allocation, which does not increase that, and through programs. Actually, uh, almost all African countries, one way or another, benefited from uh, fund support. Right now, we have 21 programs uh, with uh, African countries. Many more requests are coming. And we do concentrate a lot of attention on the countries that are under higher burden of debt, because that puts them in a, in a much uh, uh, weaker position. We have uh, asked for debt service suspension when COVID started. We have pressed for the common framework for debt resolution, the G20 adopted. 
And while slow, it is producing some results. Chat resolved, Ghana on its way to be resolved, and I am uh, positive about Zambia, Ethiopia coming next. We have to stay the course, because if we don't, there are 19 countries out of the 35 low-income countries in Africa that are either at debt distress, those four are there, or are near debt distress. And if we don't have a resolution pathway, yes, we can accumulate a bigger problem that can then uh, affect the rest of the world. Uh, what are you doing to try and get China or the big banks or others to, to be transparent about the money that they've lent? Well, the um, uh, accumulation of debt and changing landscape with m number of countries now not able to serve is the most important incentive to all creditors to move in a coordinated manner to debt resolution. Because if they don't, creditors also get burned. They get affected by the fact that countries cannot service their obligations. It is complex, but I am encouraged by what we have experienced so far with the um, uh, sovereign uh, debt roundtable. Because the participation both of China and private sector is very constructive. They actually do want to have some uh, principles on which resolution uh, is being done. They're particularly con concerned about comparability of treatment, and this is a topic we are, we are focusing on. We want to have a, a, an agreement of how this is going to be pursued by our annual meetings in October. We are also working with uh, China on debt uh, reporting, because within the country, there are so many lenders, uh, development banks, Exim Bank, the um, uh, state-owned enterprises, that China itself doesn't quite yet have a full handle on how much uh, has been provided as loans. Uh, I have no illusion that this would be a uh, taxing process, but what is the alternative? Uh, the alternative is countries suffering with protracted and inefficient uh, debt resolution. It would be a bumpy road, but a road that leads to a better uh, debt resolution. There's been some criticism of the programs that have been introduced to help countries in debt distress uh, since COVID. Uh, Oxfam published a paper last month, uh, and according to their research, for every one dollar the IMF encouraged a set of poor countries to spend on public goods, it has told them to cut four times as much through austerity measures. So what Oxfam's arguing is that they're saying what, what you've called social spending flaws, which are uh, conditions in, in the loans which are meant to protect uh, social spending for health, uh, education, and so on. They're saying that these have proved largely powerless against the IMF's own uh, austerity policies which uh, oblige countries to cut public funding. So wh what they're arguing, I think, is as much as there's a good intention to try and protect the, uh, these you know, essential public services, that that's still getting crushed and destroyed by the obligation of these countries to, in the end of the day, cut, cut expenditure. So I respectfully disagree. I have a high opinion of Oxfam. I like the, f the fact that they're pushing us to do better. But when you look at our programs, you need to remember that what we lend is only a small fraction of what we mobilize as program support. So we should not be measuring what we do on the basis of the IMF loan. We should look at what does that loan do to bring more financing from other partners who would have not been there in the absence of this anchor that the IMF program provides. And two, it has to take into account the way in which we define the objectives of the program. And yes, we do work to protect uh, social spending, especially education, health, and social protection. 
a very big part of IMF programs is directed not to the people who are vulnerable, but to make sure that the wealthy contribute more. We demand taxation to go up for the higher income and for taxes to be collected. Oxfam say that the IMF is not doing that uh, enough and that it should, for example, that put, good put, put the, the, you know, the pressure that's put on governments to, for example, cut subsidies, that the same kind of pressure could be put on governments to introduce redistributive policies or taxes or, or, or other such measures. I agree. I agree we can do more. And uh, we do the analytical work in advance, so we can do more. We have been very clear that there has to be progressivity in taxation. And we are translating this into our programs. But let me be also very uh, frank on subsidies. We are being cr criticized for uh, advising governments. By the way, we are not demanding governments. Governments have to take it, to own it, to do it. Uh, we are advising them to eliminate harmful subsidies and translate fraction of the money, a good portion of the money, into support for low-income uh, uh, people. Why? Because who is the biggest uh, beneficiary of your subsidies? The rich. Who drives big cars uh, on long trips? It is the wealthy people. Why should the poor people in a country be subsidizing the rich? That is, I think Oxfam would agree with me that this is a very, very poor uh, poorly designed policy. The IMF and the World Bank uh, just two years ago uh, agreed to reduce Sudan's debt by about 20 billion dollars. How have the subsequent events, the coup and now the conflict, affected that program? Uh, certainly uh, negatively. Um, this is such a tragedy. The young people and the women of Sudan won that support. And uh, now they are those that are losing because of the uh, most recent developments. Uh, a conflict is always a terrible thing, but a conflict that crushes the newly found hopes of a nation, uh, it is even, even more terrible because it's like throwing cold water on this, uh, on these hopes, um, I um, I have been following um, the engagement from the region. Uh, Igat, President Bruto here. I really hope that there would be a pathway to restore a uh, civilian government in Sudan. Um, I am also very concerned about potential spillovers. The visible spillover, people fleeing to other countries, already there. But we know from so many painful experiences that the invisible spillover, the trouble that travels uh, and impacts negatively neighbors is the one uh, that, that uh, we have to be concerned. So the sooner there is peace and then return to a democratic uh, government, the better. If we stand back for a minute and look at a sort of much bigger picture of how we ended up in this world today, which is so unequal. Uh, I mean, the ascendancy of, uh, of the West uh, has something that's gone on for about 500 years, 400 of which were, you know, involved, uh, or colonialism, slavery were involved in this massive accumulation of, uh, of wealth in uh, just uh, a couple of parts. Uh, of the world, and then it's only really within sort of the last 70 years or less that we've instead been talking about a different model development, about poor countries borrowing from rich countries to, you know, to, to try and grow and to try and equalize the situation, and with the exception of China, which has lifted millions of people out of poverty through industrialization, among the poorest countries in the global south, it, it would appear that this sort of relatively recent model hasn't worked. It hasn't redressed the imbalances of the past, inequalities still growing, Africa's greatest uh, exports are its commodities, its natural materials. Uh, and so the, 
the whole system that was set up after the Second World War with the World Bank and with the IMF, which they're part of, and this whole system of uh, rich countries lending money to poor countries to develop. Is it working? Is it ever going to work? Well, there are many more examples than just uh, China. Uh, you travel around uh, Asia, you go to Indonesia, you go to Vietnam, uh, you go to India, and you see dynamism uh, that is uh, also lifting uh, people out of poverty, creating uh, uh, broadly opportunities. Uh, you travel in Africa, you go to Senegal, you go to Cote d'Ivoire, uh, you go to Rwanda. You see that there is uh, prosperity being built on a more integrated uh, global economy. Uh, I think the problem uh, is that uh, what is holding countries back more often than not is rule of law, insufficient governance, not up to par to the aspirations of people. And the result is policies just simply don't create an inclusive growth uh, model. The uh, very uh, important lesson we learned at the fund is that if a program is not owned by the country, even if it technically achieves targets, it may not be sustained. And if a program is not promoting inclusivity, if it is not making the fabric of society stronger, not doing its uh, job entirely. Should rich countries uh, and industrialized countries who benefited from uh, and continue to benefit from using far more fossil fuels than everyone else and continuing to emit more carbon. Should they pay for the damage that's done in poor countries, for example, Somalia uh, in this region, which is yes. suffering a, yep. a devastating drought for the worst in, first in decades, you know, people are dying. Should the rich countries that benefited from this be picking up the bill? They should be much more generous, yes. Uh, the fact that we are still not reaching the 100 billion a year uh, is uh, uh, actually not a strong evidence of commitment to global public goods. Uh, we have uh, developed at the IMF a way in which rich countries can help poor countries to adapt to climate change and move to a low carbon emission path. This is the Resilience and Sustainability Trust. So far, we have received uh, uh, pledges, and uh, most of that pledges have already materialized, of $40 billion. This is using SDRs we allocated to rich countries that don't need it to lend through the fund on concessional terms, long term, to vulnerable low-income and middle-income countries. More of this needs to be done. I am uh, very uh, positive that we will prove that this instrument of structural transformation for a world living with the climate crisis is impactful, is effective, and then we would get more of our members to commit uh, to it. Each and every one of us has to do its part and concentrate especially on those that have done nothing to create the problem of climate change, but are most severely impacted by its uh, consequences. And on economic shocks, finally, what do you expect? The uh, rapidly growing uh, area of artificial intelligence, mm. which is changing the world before our very eyes, what's that going to do to the world economy? We are not prepared. What is the employment opportunity we offer to people that are displaced by artificial intelligence? So there is a huge urgency for all of us, and actually at the fund this is something we are concentrating on. Uh, and I must admit, I, I am, uh, I am uh, sometimes waking up in the middle of the night thinking, can we really catch up? Can we think through? What does that mean? What does it mean for the uh, financial system? Uh, if we are to move to a world of artificial uh, intelligence. So, uh, so my, my uh, uh, appeal is uh, to, to get the um, public sector, the leadership in, in, in countries and global leadership to be much more focused on understanding, projecting the uh, implications of artificial uh, intelligence and uh, be able to put some guardrails before it is too late. Kristalina Georgieva, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera.
Thank you.